I did a rotation at uh, Children's Hospital uh, in neurosurgery, which was uh, overseen by the premier pediatric neurosurgeon in the country, Dr. Donald Matson. I was so impressed with Dr. Matson as a person and as a surgeon uh, and as a teacher that it was persuasive in convincing me that I really wanted to be a neurosurgeon and in fact I simply stated wanted to be like Don Matson. But I can remember the moment where Dr. Sweet paged me and I picked up the page on a hall telephone and he said, Paul, he said, we need a pediatric neurosurgeon at MGH. I can arrange for you to go to the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, which at that time was the premier neurosurgical pediatric training program in North America. He said, you can be the chief resident there, and then after that, you'll go to London, England, and you'll be a, a neurosurgical registrar at Great Ormond Street at the Children's Hospital there. It was one of these moments that is intuitively exciting to you. It's not a, it's not a thought out logical process. And I immediately said, sure. Here's the whole entire medical house staff during my internship year. And there were only 30 people. You notice that everybody's wearing white pants and white coats and uh, some of us wearing white shoes. The pants and the coats were supplied they were laundered by the uh, hospital. And so when we heard that our salary was $25 a month, it was explained that this wasn't so bad because it came with laundry, it came with a place to sleep, and uh, all the food you could eat. So who needed money? But if one was married and had kids, the $25 didn't go far. So they were kind and agreed to raise the salary to $50 for people who had wives and or children. The time that's available to spend with patients has shrunken amazingly, uh, both inpatient and outpatient. I always uh, took a half an hour to see patients, and I still do, although we are requested or even required to uh, see patients in every 15 minutes and accomplish about uh, 10 different checklist things during that time. Uh, but I can't do that, and so I don't do that. And so I get paid less, but it uh, continues to be much more satisfying than if we were rushing. Judah Folkman was my first chief resident when I was an intern. And Judah, as many know uh, who knew him, was a doer. Uh, nothing would stand in his way of taking care of the patient. And he had a patient who required dialysis, uh, had kidney failure and required artificial kidney treatments. And this is in 19, late 1964, early 1965. The Massachusetts General Hospital, believe it or not, didn't have an artificial kidney machine available. And I had come from Colorado where I had worked in a dialysis unit and it was second nature to me. And so I said to Judah, if I had a machine, I could dialyze this patient. And he said, well, what do you need? And I said, we need a tub, we need a little motor, we need a filter, it's a, and I gave him the list, and he said, let's go. We got into his old beat-up station wagon, and we drove around to junkyards, and literally picked up a washing machine and a few things that we needed, and we built an artificial kidney here at the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, in January of 1965, and dialyzed that patient. That was the first patient to receive hemodialysis, who was a general surgical patient at the Mass General. Can you imagine the, with the oversight and the regulations now uh, getting a washing machine, we would have had the police all over us. Uh, where's your permit? Where's your consent? Where's your policy? But uh, this patient was in desperate need and uh, we were able to help that patient within 24 hours of driving around to the junkyards. The only way off the farm in those days was to you either go to college or you wind up uh, uh, going into the military. So I went to the recruiting office, which was next door to the principal's office, and I asked them, was it possible that I could join the Navy? They, they asked me about being an athlete, 
to represent the Seven Rebel Labor Command, which was at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. And I went on to uh, become an AAU, SAA, Maryland State, Eastern All Navy, and Desland, and in a service champion. I came to Mass General because I had a lot of experience working around the hospital due to the fact I did most of my on-duty training in the dispensary area. I was working for buildings and grounds. I did, I washed windows from the, from the white 12 all the way down to the basement. This uh, doctor walked by and says, I know you. You was at the NIH in Bethesda. I said, yeah. He goes, oh, oh you, you are too important to be up here doing what you're doing. So I trained to do perioperative nursing. And from that, I learned to become a perfusionist. And I received the highest award that you could get in perfusionist. I don't think no one in the world could ever be as lucky as I was, truthfully. I worked in pediatric outpatient and inpatient social service. And my inpatient work was on Burnham 6, which happened to house the intensive care unit. And in that context, I met with many families with many, many problems, including, of course, grieving over uh, losing a child who was too ill to be saved, um, but also about uh, seeing many children who were traumatized. That was before uh, trauma teams had been developed in other, uh, in other hospitals. And so um, I went about developing one here at Mass General. I selected a, a nurse who was a wonderful uh, understanding nurse um, in the pediatric service. And there was a physician, Dr. Guthrie, who was happy to join us. And um, out of that work came not only uh, the initial mission, which was getting people to talk to each other and work well together, but a symposium where we could uh, invite people from all over New England, actually, lawyers, social workers, physicians, nurses, whoever um, was concerned. And then out of that grew two textbooks. When I think of my work at Chelsea Health Center, I think of working in a community with so many wonderful clients who need help, who are so grateful for the help, and I think of working in a unit which is so wonderful. Well, I thought originally, going back to college, that I wanted to be a medical researcher, whatever that meant. My second and third years of medical school, I took the year out and took a fellowship here in the Department of Pathology. Then I returned to my third year and fourth year and got clinical training in medical school. And by that time, I think I thought maybe I should be a clinician as well as a scientist. But then they offered me the chief residency in medicine, and I couldn't turn that down. I mean, that was the sort of summit of my aspiration at that time. And then I joined the staff, and one thing led to another. I found I was better and better at clinical medicine and less and less interested in research. Well, it's odd to look back on it now, but I was very nervous when I started talking to patients. In fact, at that stage, I was very nervous talking to anybody. But I managed to bluff my way through giving talks and presenting cases, and I found that uh, talking to patients was challenging and interesting because it was sort of a puzzle, told as a narrative story from their part, and I was able to expand it. Um, and I found the detective work and the interaction with patients um, intellectually challenging, but personally just plain fun. And I think um, the patients and I related to each other generally very well, and it's a very satisfying experience when you can solve a problem nobody solved before to the satisfaction of the patient and help them in the next step along the way. When I was uh, looking around at Cambridge and, and uh, thinking that I was trying to decide whether I was going to continue my career there or, or do something else, the opportunity came along to uh, assume the practice of one of the senior cardiologists here who had been one of my teachers back in the day on the, on the old Bullfinch service, Conger Williams. Now, Conger was part of a group that, invo that included Alan Friedlich and Ed Wheeler. Alan and Ed had both been mentors and teachers and so forth back in the day. So it was going to be a real pleasure to join them. 
And so one time I was meeting with Ed before I came back over and, and uh, they actually had an office over in Charles River Park at that particular point in time. And he said to me, he says, uh, well, I think you'll like coming back. He says, there, there's a, that great big hospital over there talking about across, right across the street. He says, uh, it's all there for you. And it was true. In 1964, I was in, going into my third year residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Dr. Alexander Gutman, who was the chief of medicine at Mount Sinai, was interested in my career. And I had lined up a fellowship in cardiology. And Dr. Gutman said to me, you know, Martin, we have cardiologists and gastroenterologists standing on their heads around here. He said, have you ever been interested in dermatology? And I said, no, Dr. Gutman, not really. I said, you know, here they talk about, about dermatology being wormatology, the lowest form of medical life. But I've always been interested in mast cells and in melanocytes. And he said, well, I just have the place for you to go. He said, there's a man by the name of Fitzpatrick in Boston who's training good internists to be dermatologists. And he said, I think you should really go and try. And if you like it, you can come back and set up a dermatology program here at Mount Sinai. I came to Boston and I had a four hour interview with uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick, at the end of which he said, I'll hire you. Well, the MGH was very different from Mount Sinai. I felt that immediately there was a different difference in patient attitude. It was extraordinary to me where nurses, for example, without any compunction would stay an hour or two after if they needed the clinic. There were no complaints. I went into medicine from law school, and uh, I did, I left the law because I felt that if I did my best, I might never know if I do good for a person or not. And I felt that in medicine, if I did my best every day, I would do good for people. In October 2010, I was, I was approached by Ronald Kleiman, the chief of pediatrics, to, to write the history of pediatrics for its first hundred years. And so I took on the job, and the first thing I discovered was that it was not a short little job like I had anticipated. I've been in the department now for half of its life, and I thought, well, I know a lot about it. Well, I knew a lot about the things that I had done <laughs> and not a whole lot about what others had done. And in the interval between the time I first came and the time that I'm writing this, the department went from three senior faculty to, um, oh, at that time, probably 30 or so. Uh, and many of those in, in charge of separate divisions, each of whom then had several other faculty. So that took a lot of digging into archives at the Countway Library, at the MGH, and the internet. And then it was a matter of, of meeting with all of these senior faculty who had come and getting input from them. And um, I found a, a relatively new company called Small Book Publishers in Amherst, Massachusetts. And uh, they were just thrilled to be able to do this. And, uh, and it was, what was fun was to be able to work firsthand with the publisher and his wife, who was the associate publisher, and, um, and make it happen. Originally, I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon when I was, a, I think, a f up until my fourth year of medical school. And then my rotation, I had a rotation in internal medicine at the general, and it was, I found it so intellectually exciting that I decided that I didn't want to be in orthopedics, that I wanted to go into internal medicine. We had to take a dermatology elective, and I like dermatology, and I actually took an, an extra course as a fourth year student in, as a, an elective course in dermatology, which you weren't, weren't required to do. And I, I found it very interesting because you could see the patients, take samples of the patients. I thought that was kind of exciting. I decided that I would do a year of dermatology in lieu of the three years I had to do as a resident in, at the Peter Ben. And uh, so I, elect, I applied for a year here, actually, in dermatology. I found it, you know, a lot of fun, and also I found a lot of challenges that I hadn't appreciated before, and recognized that there were a lot of opportunities uh, in dermatology that were developing that had, were sort of new. Also became interested in an academic career, and the opportunities in dermatology for an academic career were quite good at that time. And I said, you know, I like dermatology. I'm, you know, I think I'll just stay and do dermatology as my career, and it'll give me the opportunity to do academic medicine. And so I just 
told the Brigham people, sorry, but I'm not coming back, <laughs> and stayed here to f complete the program. My first published paper, published with Dr. Larry Egbert in 1963, we took the patients of two surgeons, one group of patients we gave an education to, the other group of patients we gave what we considered the average pre-anesthetic visit. The patients who received the education required 50% less morphine for post-op pain than the other group. Larry and I were out to prove that the visit by the anesthesiologist was as good as drugs. So again, we took randomized patients. One half, we gave Nembutal preoperatively as a sedative. The other half, we gave no Nembutal but we spent time educating them. The patients who had Nembutal were more apprehensive and nervous and anxious than the patients who had some education. We got a lot of good comments and a lot of requests to repeat the study with others. My standard answer was, look, I will be your consultant but you'll have to do all that work. Nobody ever took me up on that. I worked nights mainly because I had um, children at home. My husband could go to work during the day and I could be there during the day. I came in one Sunday night and there was this very ill baby. He had uh, meningococcemia, which is, we called it the blueberry muffin disease at that time because your skin developed all these blue spots all over him. I took care of the baby, was on precautions, and his parents happened to come in and they saw me dancing in the room with the rhythm and blues radio on. And the mother immediately demanded that I be taken off the case. And they told her, she comes in, she will take your baby every night. She is one of our best nurses. You could do well to have her. It took a few weeks, but finally um, I got rapport with the parents. They were satisfied with the care the baby was getting, and the mother later told me she thought perhaps that's why her baby pulled through, because of the music. I kept in touch with his parents. I went to his high school graduation. He decided he wanted to become a nurse, I think because of his experiences that he had. I went to his wedding, and then he had a baby of his own and that baby happened to be a patient in the same NICU that he was also a patient at that time. He since had two other children and the family is doing well. I chose radiology very early uh, in my medical school training because I saw how they helped the clinicians. I saw that they dealt with all aspects, not just hearts or kidneys or bones. And I liked to, to see what was going on. Many of the articles I read really talked about advances in understanding diseases through the use of radiology. Also, I had always read the New England Journal very carefully, and the CPCs all came from Mass General. This was the center of medicine, of advances that were happening, and the people who were here were phenomenal. I have met so many wonderful people, and not just radiologists, I mean, not, not just, but the clinicians, many of whom are no longer with us, unfortunately. It was just a thrill and an honor to be associated with them. I recognize that the hospital is over 200 years old, and I have been here for almost a quarter of a century. Having worked here at Mass General Hospital for 55 years has been a humbling experience. It's sort of an honor and a privilege, frankly. I mean, <laughs> we're all very proud of being at Mass General and being trained here. Anything you need to know, it's uh, uh, you can always find somebody that knows it.
the greatest achievement of my life is the people that I've taught uh, that are now out there doing the things that I wish I would have had time to do. It has always meant so much to be working for an institution that people are so proud of and that is devoted to providing good care. What keeps me going is the energy of discovery and the energy uh, that is derived from helping patients. It makes me feel privileged that I've been here while in the hospital and the various departments have undergone absolutely phenomenal changes. The thing that I appreciate the most about having been here for 50 years is seeing the advances and they are astounding. To do and invent and innovate in areas that are, were closest to me and, um, and be able to see those innovations make a difference in the lives of, of not only the children, but the, the nurses and the staff. The institution means a lot. I just wish I could give back half of what they gave me. I think it was 55 years well spent.